Hello, and welcome to another episode of eBay Scavengers. This is episode number 109 on ebayscavengers.com. Now today, Jay and I are speaking to Tom, who is an eBay seller and a scavenger in the UK. Okay, so today we're talking with Tom, the English picker. This is cool for us because, you know, we have said several times on the podcast that we'd love to talk to scavengers who are working and living in other countries other than America. We in America, we think it's all about us, and obviously it's not. Yeah, we would just love to hear how things are different in other countries. And so Tom, it reached out to us, and um, and when I kind of did some his, his research on him, he, it sh- showed that he's been doing this for a long time and has a lot of good info to share. So Tom, I first just want to thank you for coming on today. Oh, hi there. Yeah, it's a very, uh, very kind word <laughs> spoken. Um, more of a modest person, but yeah, nice yeah. to be here. Anyway. I mean, I think what's interesting when I looked at, at your store is that it you sell a metal and kind of trinkets or rings and things like that, I mean, is that just a stuff? Stuff that is interesting to it you, or that's the easiest stuff to find. It's sort of easier to find. I mean, it sort of harks back to your your one of your last po- podcasts uh, when you were talking about flea markets. I used to be the guy looking for scrap, looking for gold and silver, <laughs> rummaging in, picking up everything. Yep. And that was me. And then I sort of had a bit of an awakening because I was scrapping all these nice pieces of jewellery, and I could have sold them for so much more than their scrap. So kind of an evolution yeah, of that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that happens to all of us, is that we start out in one thing. Like, we have talked about, we were selling, like, a vintage clothes and shoes, and then it realized that there's a whole other a world out there of all these other kinds of items. So I, I've always been a, a scavenger, really, from when I was younger, but it's just turning what was essentially a hobby into a, a full-time business. Okay, so let's get down to, because I think what's interesting about this is that you can help the American scavengers kind of get a its perspective. So here in America, a thrifting and scavenging is basically a mainstream now. You know, there are television shows about it. I mean, on a YouTube, there's endless uh, videos of people talking about it. I mean, we have uh, thrift stores in America that are gigantic and they're basically just a retail stores now where it's not a big deal to go and buy old clothes. So can you explain how is it seen in the uh, UK? There are distinct similarities but also huge differences. I, I mean I'd love to just be able to go to one large <laughs> shop and be able to pick up old things. I have to do quite a lot of running around to different venues. I don't know whether the word thrifting is used in the UK. It's more sort of uh, antique mm. collecting. It was popular in sort of the late 80s, early 90s, but then fell out of favour somewhat, you know, consumerism and um, uh, mm. things like that. But recently, in the last probably five years or so, it's come back in mainly through, because we obviously we have the Antiques Roadshow as well, things like that. And then some of the um, Discovery Channel shows with like the storage things. Right. And storage wars, yeah. yeah. Yeah, all those sort of get rich yep. quick sort of <laughs> doesn't fill in all the details. It includes a huge amount of people, especially American pickers as well. But I mean, that's that's just really pushed a lot of people back into it in this but mainly into a kind of get rich quick kind of yeah. scheme right you see a lot of people starting off but they don't make it past a couple of months really because they either lose interest or find that they can't work right like i mean that. i think yeah i mean one reason why we do this podcast is because people will watch those shows or those youtube videos and then they go and spend you know eight hundred dollars on a locker or go and buy a bunch of junk and realize it's a lot of work to sell it or it's not worth anything. Yeah, I mean, that's that's so true. I mean, I see a lot of people dabbling in scrap because of that, because it's easy. And um, a lot of people have dropped out of it lately because the price of the gold and silver have crashed so much. Yeah, but in terms of what you were saying about uh, thrift shops and stuff like that, we have similar sort of things called charity shops, which mm-hmm. are... They're small, in, not, you get a mixture of independent charities and then larger charities, things like Cancer Research and Oxfam. They're small shops, probably inside maybe 25 foot by 14 to 15 foot wide. Wow, retail. tiny. And there's the small chains of them, so you'll see one or two in each city. Things like Oxfam, they look up every single book on Amazon. 
So you, mm. you can do it there. Now, real quick though, so because we actually were in Croydon in London a couple of uh, years ago for another kind of a work that we do, and we scavenged a little bit, yeah, and we would come across these little tiny. The charity sh- shops. Yeah, these little tiny shops. I mean, is that because England can't, doesn't produce enough, like, over, I, I you know, trash to do that? I think, I mean, there's certainly a lot of waste, um, but it's a mixture of two factors I was thinking about this. One is the nature of our high streets. There just simply isn't room for these huge, right. large shopping. Hmm. We have sort of out-of-town shopping precincts and things like that, but the there isn't room for those so it's it's all about the small victorian mm. shops but also it's actually a lot about regulations my um grandmother used to work in a charity shop and the stories of the things they threw away because health and safety regulations meant that they couldn't sell it things like amazing collectible pocket knives oh, and any they can't sell any earrings or anything oh. like that you know it's it's interesting that you bring that up because i didn't think about it i guess maybe one reason why the rise of these giant thrift stores in america has happened is because probably like during the 80s and uh, 90s just things got so overbuilt that now there are these empty uh, shopping uh, malls and these big uh, thrift stores are basically just taking over where these big stores is once were that had gone out of business. You know, just a, l- a lot of empty uh, real estate in America. Also, something that we thought of too is like the UK has about like 60 million people and we have 350 million people in it's just so many more people like buying crap and then getting rid of it i wonder yeah i think also because there's there's a whole uh sort of make and men do mentality as well that people will of a certain age group will will mend things and not and not throw them away or give them away they'll they'll carry on using them and making them work Mm. Uh, but there is the modern day throwaway culture which has come in which has sort of revitalized the whole thrifting because people are starting to get rid of things just because a cord's broken or the zipper's broken or that sort of thing. A lot of the stuff that we buy and sell comes from like estate sales. So when someone passes away, their family will take what they want and then just, you know, you know, just do a big a sale on everything else and the house does it happen in england estate sales not so much i've in the about five years i've been doing this i think i've only been to two or three Hmm. and they're they're not really something which happens so much normally what happens is there's an auction house and the the family consigns everything to an auction house so it's all dealt with by this third party and goes through by the auction process so um yeah it'd be be great i'd love to (laughs) <laughs> have a go around someone's house and do that but no it's all categorized it's all sort of research and and auctions you do it's they sound very similar because you do get box lots sort of tray lots yeah and then in- why don't we just start kind of from then step it's one because we always like to take people through a process so where are you finding items you know can did you explain that to us the majority of my items used to come from what are called car boot sales which are very much sound very similar to your flea markets it's yeah. a, it's, it's a field where people drive out in their cars <laughs> they just throw everything out on the floor or on a table and uh, and sell stuff and and that's how i got started really was buying things there it's normally the cheapest place to buy things as well because people aren't really that fussed and 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 a real quick why or who are these people are they it's pickers themselves like where do they get that stuff it's just their own stuff it's this kind of weird subculture that's um and and in your in your thing about the flea market the people you were describing they're the people that i would see at, at the local car boot sale there's yep. a guy who it looks like has taken everything out of a house <laughs> put it on a blanket without any care. Filthy, grubby goods. Uh, there's the, the prim and proper lady who's got high priced antiques and she's researched everything with eBay printouts. Yep. And then you've just got a family who've, whose kids have got too big and they're selling off their toys. It's, it's yep. a real mixture of people. 
See, I wish we called flea markets car boot sales here. Why, why is it that? just sounds so cool. <laughs> car boot. Fle- rather than flea, flea market. Yeah, I don't know where that comes from. I mean, you do get flea markets here in the UK, but they're in a marketplace with market stalls, mm-hmm. and, they're, and they're the pickers that sell off their goods, aren't they? Right. Now, do you have anything like yard sales or stoop sales where people just put a bunch of stuff in their front yard or their garage? Not at all. It's wow. uh, occasionally you do, but it just it doesn't it doesn't seem to it, nothing that it doesn't catch on because a lot of the urban communities, people don't even know their neighbors at all either side of them. So it doesn't really happen. But people will be more than willing to go to these car boot sales. So uh, so people don't uh, sell in front of their house? I mean, is any of it just because people would think it was weird or it's, it's just not a common... I just don't think it's it's in the uh, the British psyche to, to do that sort of thing. It doesn't seem appropriate. <laughs> We've got to sort of separate themselves from where they live and their stuff. It's some kind of bizarre psychology there. Yeah. So, so then it, you talked about that you started out at car boot sales, but has that yeah. gone to uh, something else now? Well, I do like going to them. The problem is they start at about six o'clock in the morning mm. um, weekends, and um, it's just it, it's it's good in the summer when the weather's good. But we've had a a few summers of terrible weather, so I've had to look at other areas which has led me into the more of the antique scene, which I can consistently find good quality quality items, but for a higher price point. If you talked about that when we were emailing back and forth before this uh, podcast, is that if you were saying that if you think it's weird in America or it's different in America how people are willing to buy things that are 10 or 20 years old, whereas in England, people are looking for things that are 100 or more <laughs> years old. Is that yeah. true? Yeah. That that is very true. I mean, I'd say uh, when describing vintage, because there's a huge upsurge in the last five years of, of this vintage. It's also teamed in with people dressing in the sort of 1940s style, especially in London and around there. There's a lot of a lot of money to be made in vintage clothing from, I'd say, between the 1940s and the, the latest, probably the 1980s. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder if that's just because, you know, America's a, a younger country and we just don't have, obviously, the, the, the history. You know, like when we watch Antiques, a roadshow, the one produced in, in, in England, I mean, stuff is, you know, from the 1600s, 1500s. And yeah, and here, if you found that stuff, I mean, it would just be it unbelievable. It wouldn't be anything. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just, you don't find stuff like that here for, you know, that old. Yeah, I, I guess that, that that's probably probably why there's the sort of a more of an accumulation of, of history here. I mean, I know I, I personally have got a cabinet and an antique centre, and they won't. You can't call anything antique. It's got to be over a hundred years old. Yeah. Mm. That's funny. You can't put anything in there uh, after the 1970s. Hmm. So, oh wow, they're very strict about what you can put in there. So. I laugh at watching some of the other online people who, who and on YouTube are saying, oh, I'm going to put pearl snap shirts or cowboys <laughs> in my antique booth. And I think, oh, I'd never be able to go with something like that. I think that's interesting, too, because we actually still buy and sell a lot of old clothes. But in America, you really don't find clothes older than, I mean, if you find something from the uh, 50s, it's amazing. Because yeah. I feel like older clothes maybe it's just in america they they fall apart or they've been a, a worn out so it's interesting that england still has clothes from the 40s or earlier yeah i mean um, some of the things you see i mean i think that's mainly true also over here clothes are definitely something i don't see much at antique shows occasionally you do see things uh, i've just bought a uh, a 1940s PVC rain jacket, World War II one, and that thing's barely, barely in one piece because it's falling to bits. But mm. on the other hand, you can be walking around a show, and I uh, bought an, uh, a glass case for myself for displaying at shows, and underneath the um, the backing base part, I found a small coin, and it was uh, Anglo-Saxon. So that over a thousand years old. Oh my God, <laughs> Jesus! It's amazing. I mean, you can't find anything like that here. There's just yeah. they, it doesn't exist. Right. 
<laughs> you accidentally stumble across all, all sorts of things like that. At car boot sales, I've seen over 2,000-year-old Roman coins that people have found. And, wow. But those sort of things, it's, it's funny that some things like that can be not, not worth too much. A Roman coin could mm. be worth pounds, so that's mm. about dollars maybe. So now if you're buying mainly from antiquers, now how are you able to buy it cheap enough and resell it at a good price? I, I think the key to that is is the sort of knowledge of niche markets. A lot of these antiquers are good generalists. They sort of know a good that they have a good general awareness of, of different bits. But if, if you're good at say have um, sort of half a dozen niche markets of things you know about Right. Then you can cherry pick bits out of out of their cases at these huge, massive antique shows. I mean, there's one that I go to that's just sort of a bi-monthly one, and there's I think over three thousand vendors spend two whole days looking around and not see everything. Wow. So what kinds of things are you really like focused on finding? Like, is there anything in particular that you always go for? I, I mainly deal really in coins and uh, jewellery. It's the two things that I've, I've got knowledge of. But I've started recently in sort of dabbling in art and sort of other bits. Also, I do um, I do sell through Amazon, so I'm always looking at the books mm. as well, oh, wow. scanning scanning books. So, so it's something we've talked about in the uh, in last podcast when we were talking about uh, uh, flea markets. Why do you think these people who sell in these like antique uh, uh, malls? Why don't they sell online? Is is it popular to sell online in England? Yeah, I think it's quite popular, I, but I think a lot of these people don't do it through fear more than anything. They're mm. scared that they'll somehow get scammed. Mm. They hear all these horror stories from online communities of buy by scam by this buyer and all this. And, that. and to be honest, I'm I'm quite happy to reinforce that stereotype. Because <laughs> I get better deals. So. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it sounds like it, you also deal it's with those uh, sellers who will it print out the eBay uh, listings, hoping to get that kind of price. You know. Yeah, and it's never the completed items. It's always what some crazy person's asking for something. And yeah. right, exactly. Right. You're like, I don't think that person actually sold it for that much. Yeah. Uh, no. Sometimes I do like to have a laugh and put into the eBay first item in a certain category just to see if someone's asking silly money for something. You'd be amazed. Now, do, do you get a sense of, I mean, are, is there a growing number of people in the uh, UK that do this uh, full-time, who uh, sell online full-time? I think, I think there is. I think there's a much higher percentage of people, certainly post-recession, uh, credit crunch, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. of, or wanting to sort of top up their income, mm. uh, so they'll go to the car boot sales at weekends, or they'll they'll go round you know the thrift shops, charity shops, and and sell bits to top up their income. And a lot of my friends have, having seen what I've done, have, have started to do that. And to be honest, that's how I how I started. I had a, a full time job, and I I did eBay on the side, and then I realised that. My full-time job was getting in the way of eBay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that sounds well. That's a uh, that is always a good thing when you're making it's more money on eBay than uh, in uh, it's your regular job. That's when we always tell people. That's when it, you know it's okay to go full time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, much to the confusement of of my girlfriend, my yeah. family, <laughs> I couldn't understand why I quit a perfectly good job just to sell old things on eBay. <laughs> I don't think we still quite understand it. Yeah, it, it seems like that's a global thing when family and friends can't understand why a scavenger would actually do this for a living. Yeah. And it's actually um, it's nice listening to um, uh, your shows because it's sort of a, a ray of hope into a somewhat <laughs> gloomyness uh, sometimes when uh, you know people are giving you. Well, you talk to I still talk to some people and then. I could talk for a few minutes and then I get this sort of glazed yeah. look. <laughs> yeah. They're, they oh. just, they think they, they, it's almost like they just don't believe it. They think you're making it up or it's a hobby or. Yeah. yeah for sure. 
I mean, honestly, I just spent the morning uh, watching some uh, YouTube uh, videos of of these Americans who make it videos about scavenging. And sometimes I feel that way even. I get a little sad just because of the way that they talk about it. It does seem a little scammy and, uh, you know, get rich quick and that kind well, of thing. Well, some people make it sound like that. Right. So I feel like when you tell people, oh, I make a living on eBay, they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's like a picture in uh, in uh, my head of those kind of people. And uh, it does make me a little sad because it just feels, it doesn't feel like a solid thing like we're trying to all do yeah i mean uh, there is a very very fine line between being a scavenger and being a hoarder as well which yes. is something right I think a lot of people struggle with there's certainly a high population of collectors or obsessive compulsive hoarders in the uk it seems yep. to be something that's popular especially with the guys who, who buy old tools as well Yep. It's that to be quite prolific. Okay, we wanted so now it's you're finding all of it's a stuff and then it you bring it home and then I just take it the its process is the exact same. You clean it, you take a picture of it, enlist it, right? Yeah, I mean really it's it's just a lot of what I do is just cleaning something properly, describing it right and putting it in the right place because a lot of people are uncertain about what something is, so they'll just sell it for its scrap price or sort of, um, I even buy things that sort of double, triple their scrap price and they'll, they'll sell for 10, 20 times the scrap price just because you've, you've cleaned it and described it properly. Yeah, so the research is is key always so actually for a while when last summer when the the weather was bad and there was no car boot sales what i was actually doing is i was buying things on ebay that were improperly described (laughs) getting receipts of them cleaning them taking nice photos and selling them again on ebay wow that's funny that you mentioned that because we we have tried to do that and i would love to even do a whole show about that because it would be so interesting because so many people on eBay either, like you said, describe it wrong. People spell things wrong. They take horrible photos and you get it. You can buy it for nothing. Yeah, there are apps that help you with that. There's one called Fat Fingers. Where yep. people talk to but I think that's less uh, prominent now because eBay is with their software. If you search for something, it'll, it'll find the spelling errors even mm. if you don't have that in. So that's less obvious now. Now, do you find that uh, most of your buyers are in the UK or international? I'd say that not, probably about 85 to 90 percent of my buyers are in the UK. For a long time, I didn't even offer international shipping because I'd had a few bad experiences with it. But now I, I put international shipping on there, but I put proper tracked postal rates, which deter only the you know only the sort of the people who aren't going to scam you with the right. items, basically. So when you do um, shipping, can you print shipping through eBay, like for, for Royal Mail, or how do you have to do it? Uh, they do now. They've just introduced a thing for, I mean, I'm sure it was so for power sellers before, but they've just introduced a scheme where you can do that um, now. Uh, but most most of the time I've got a book of stamps and I just weigh the things and put put the stamps on and walk to the post office. Um, and then for international, how do you what kind of um, shipping do you have that has full tracking? There's different levels. I mean, it's it's difficult with international shipping when selling jewelry because a lot of it won't be covered. You you can't get sh- shipping that's anywhere near affordable for jewellery. So a lot of the time you have to kind of take an educated risk really sending it, Um, unless it's a really high-valued item and then the buyer's willing to pay 30, 40 pounds for insured tracked shipping. Hmm. Would that be through FedEx or something like that? Yeah, yeah, you can get through FedEx, but the Royal Mail do do it themselves. If I'm sending jewellery internationally, I'll do international sign for and track so it's trackable and there's a signature on upon delivery but you can't view that signature hmm. uh, I see. now what's interesting for us as american uh, sellers is you know every month we sell maybe three percent of our sales go to england you know uh 
and we're always amazed at how much they have to pay for its customs and VAT tax. I mean, it's and almost all that it's stuff. almost adds double to it what the price is. Yeah, the, the whole VAT issue is an absolute joke, really, because it, it's weird that somebody could have bought an item in the UK, uh, paid VAT on it, taken it to America, then you sell it again, then put it back in, and then you get charged VAT again. It's also more so with with some some things are, are, uh, are not eligible for that. So if you're selling gold, gold, you don't get charged VAT on it. But if you sell silver, you get charged a 20% tax on That's silver. Odd. And for and for people that don't know what a VAT tax is, because we do not have it in America, is is it's a... Value added tax? Is right. that what it is? Yeah. Yeah. And so that means any – so do did you pay a VAT tax even if you buy something inside of them? In, in inside of England or just outside? Well, really, most things that you buy at sort of a grocery store or supermarket that they have VAT on food. Food isn't doesn't have VAT on some foods. Luxury foods do. It's really complicated, and a lot of people don't even think of it because yeah, it's just it's just on everything pretty much. Well, we're glad that people still buy our our items who are in England. Sometimes we are. Sometimes we can't believe it because it's, we're like, can't they just buy this in their own country? But uh, maybe, yeah. maybe but, not. In selling on eBay, I don't have to add a VAT. Internally, hmm. I don't add a VAT tax on. But my, I am a self-employed business owner and registered with the government, so I do have to pay tax on all profit that I make through my business. Right. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah, we actually had someone else in England on the the blog a couple of weeks ago talk about this. He wanted to start to sell on eBay and was asking us about starting a business in England, which we don't know about. I mean, yeah. can anyone just start to sell on eBay or is it a special well, process? The, I, I, I mean, I'm no tax advisor, but the, I think it's you can sell up to about £3,000 worth of stuff a year without having to pay any tax on it. There's sort of an allowable amount of, of uh, things. And I think after that point, eBay contacts the inline revenue just to say, you know, look, this person is earning this amount. Are they registered as self-employed? But yeah, you can. I've got lots of friends who've got full-time jobs. They pay tax on their jobs and they sell a few few hundred pounds worth of items on eBay just to for beer money, really. Yeah, it sounds the same way in America. I think here, well... I don't think I know. It's twenty th up to twenty thousand dollars. It's you're supposed to voluntarily pay taxes on that, but up until that, the IRS won't. It's know about it. So I guess they just kind of assume it's going to be more like a a yard sale like thing. So they don't really bother with it. Yeah, and I think that's why a lot of people like doing car boot sales because it's yeah. anonymous. Yeah. yeah, it's cash. It's cash. It's the cash economy. So I think that's why people are attracted to that rather than doing a yard sale. So are you doing this full time? Because I know it you do have another kind of skill that's it's working. It's with wood, right? Yeah, I mean that's uh, kind of uh, what what I trained in. I went to university, and I, I was working in London as sort of a, uh, the head head of a furniture company, uh, furniture making company, and. The recession hit, and I uh, I lost my job. Mm. So I had to have a bit of you know sort sort around, and I decided to set up a self-employed. And yeah, I do, I do make furniture still, but the whole market of furniture and handmade furniture, because people don't really have the disposable income to pay for that sort of thing, and also the rise of IKEA, it's not taken on so much. And that's why I was kind of seeking other revenue streams and. I was always interested in antiques, and I was always scavenging for bits myself. So it just seemed a logical progression, really. And are you a working all on at your own, or is there other people involved? Um, yeah, I, I work. I work on my own. I share. Um, I share a workshop space with other artists and makers, which is quite nice. And and I share a space with a, a jeweler, and she sells online as well. So if there's anything that I've got that's broken, she can fix it for me. So. It's nice to have a bit of a community there. Hmm. Uh, they also sell online as well. And initially, I um, I did dabble in Etsy to try and sell some of my own work, which was a complete and utter failure. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you um, think that is? 
I don't know anybody who makes honest... Well, if they do make money, I think they're lying because... <laughs> <laughs> I've got friends who are on it, but they 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 do a lot of the social media side. They're always chatting to people, and it seems a lot of effort. Yeah, for a small amount of sales, really. I I agree. We I, were just having that conversation yesterday about Etsy. Yeah, yeah. Like you know, people our age, if they say they sell online, they mainly say they sell on Etsy because I think it's a very cool thing to do it's it's a very pretty site it's very it's like, very hip it's very beautiful and yeah. hip but we say we sell on ebay because that's where all the people are i mean that's where the traffic is yeah i think the serious sellers are definitely on ebay i've certainly bought things off etsy and then sold them on ebay again <laughs> um, <laughs> that's um, funny in terms of selling, I think I sold one or two items. Yeah. But I, I, I know a woman who does glass, and she sells quite a lot to all over the world. But she spends so much effort, you know, following people, commenting, and all, all the sort of social media side of things. And it's all going through her Twitter and things like that. But it just seems a lot of effort to put right. that. Well, I really like that idea, going back to what you were saying, that it, it you have... A workshop space that's it's with other people involved. I think that's kind of a cool idea. I've I've never really heard that among other eBay people about having a shared space so people could, you know, work together in a way or or uh, near each other. It was basically because we all went to university together and we we all kind of went off and did our own thing and then came back and realized that we couldn't work for anybody else any longer and. Yeah. I think I'm pretty much unemployable at this point. <laughs> yep, us I, too. I hear that all the time, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is quite cool because, you know, there's, I mean, I, I was in yesterday, there was a guy making um, the toilet cubicles for a, a petrol station whilst there was a 1940s photo shoot going on the other end while somebody was making glass. So it was really peculiar. <laughs> That's, that's super, amazing. That's so that's cool. That's super cool because, I mean, that's just interesting because a lot of people we talk to who sell on eBay, it's this very kind of solitary, isolated life. You know, they're in their basement, they're in their house, and they aren't interacting with other people as much. So that's good. Yeah, thing. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is a lot of that, and it is, um, yeah, it is quite sort of mind-numbing. And, and that's why it's good to listen to you guys on, on your things because it's, it's sort of taking me away from that and motivating me to list more. Now, can I talk specifically about it's your eBay store? Yeah, sure. Yeah. sure. So I see that you sold almost 700 things over the past 12 months, which is amazing. That's a lot of stuff. But it you seem to keep very small amounts of things online being sold at any one time. Is there a reason for that? Yeah, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I mean, I'd, I'd love to be at a point where you guys are get that amount of items on. Um, but it's because I do other things as well, I'd say 50% of, of my revenue for my business is via online, mm. and that's a way and a few bits from Amazon. Uh, I'd say 25% is selling things I've made myself and bits of teaching and things like that. And then about 20, the other 25% is doing antiques markets and shows in, in, in uh, person. Okay. So, it's quite nice to, for you to be sitting there at a show selling things and then you get that ka-ching noise on. <laughs> so it's like a force multiplier, so you're you're making more out of your time. So does that it work well going to a shows and a selling in person? Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that antique shows is a funny, funny thing because I'd say... 70% or more of the people who sell at antique shows, the, the vendors, are retired people selling things that they collected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're not serious business people. Mm -hmm. So I always find with antique shows, I end up spending more money buying stuff <laughs> than I do selling. I'm going more away from there because it seems I go to an antique show and I sell all my best things and then I'm left with mediocre things. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think we talked about that amongst ourselves about, you know, because we like to deal it's with people and we think it'd be fun to go and sell in person, but we just don't think we could ever get the amount of money in person as we get online. For some reason online, you're able to really 
just get such a wide audience, you're able to get really top dollar for items. It's funny actually, it's saying about that. Initially, when I started on eBay, I'd say 90% or more of the, what I did was auctions. I just did auctions. I'd normally exploit the, because at that time it was sort of a private account. You get free listing weekends, and I'd, I'd put on loads for that, and it, it'd be great. But now, mainly your fault, but I'm. Um, <laughs> percent or more buy it nows yep. um i used to hate buy it nows because i thought people are never going to buy this uh-huh. it's because of the all best offer yep. it, it seems like it kind of works it's more of that barter economy that i like yeah because i did notice on at your store that you still do sell some stuff in auctions and i'm surprised i don't think you're getting the kind of money in auctions like you could yeah. if you just were a, a bit more patient sometimes it's because i have to put things in auctions because it's i've, I've maybe paid a bit too much for uh, it you know, it's a cash flow shortfall situation where there's a, there's a big show coming up and i need to move some inventory which has, has been sat for a bit long and i just need mm. to clear it out i think that's mainly why i do auctions now mm. but i'm moving towards pretty much just buy it now as i would say unless it's a a popular item which has got the potential for a bidding war. I mean, yeah, I mean, those are when auctions work is when you have that little item that everybody wants and then it goes crazy. Those are always great. Although then there's always a problem where the person who uh, wins the item might have just got caught up in the its, <laughs> its moment and then don't actually pay for the item. That's the worst. I've been there. Uh, certainly with when I've started doing Buy It Now, it's my non-paying bid percentage has gone down. Yeah, that's what we like about it so, too. So if you wanted to, you know, have a goal of having a thousand items in your inventory, do you have access to that much inventory in England or in your area? Yeah, I mean this large antique show, I could if I went there I could spend ten thousand pounds easily on 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 stock. But the, my limitation is my listing process. I'm sort of fairly slow and clunky yeah. in doing it. So that that's really my my limitation and why. Uh, in terms of inventory, it's that's not so much of an issue. The buying the item, it's actually listing it. Is, is sort of my limitation, really. Yeah, it's funny. We were just talking about that on the blog last night. Someone, another a seller asked. Is what the uh, uh, his problem was with selling on eBay, and you know I think that the yeah, thing is say. is a listing. That's the bottom. That takes the most time. It's a necessary evil. Do so. What kind of age goals do did you have for two thousand and fourteen? Yeah, I'd like to um, improve the, the amount of items I do have online. I'm I'm looking at sort of getting at the moment. On average, I have about 150 to 200 items on a month. Probably a 70 to 80 percent sell through rate. Wow, so that's amazing. That's incredible. Within that month, so if I list it on this for 30 day, right now, 70 to 80 percent of it will sell by the end of the month. But it's slightly different actually because eBay UK dabbled in doing this good till cancel, but they've stopped that now. So you have to relist at the end of every month. But that's good in a way because then I can modify the prices. So, yeah, I'd, I'm going to try and get over 500 items online. Hmm. Yeah, I would love to hear how that it works out. Maybe we'll do an update it's with you in 12 months and see how that goes, you know? Sure, yeah. I mean, anytime. Certainly, yeah, but to go on. The other thing, yeah, my other goal was really to get some greater sense of automation to my things. So I've looked into there's other people on YouTube who live in England who've offered if I send them items on consignment, they'll list them for me. Mm-hmm. I'm more prepared on what they make. And I'm always dubious, as you <laughs> said, how people can make money. But this guy is, is just a listing genius. He's... Huh. he's He's like a robot in listing, so he can he can do it quite quickly. But his sort of limitation is to get out and find things. So it's, I haven't tried it yet, but it's 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 worth going and trying it. And then I've got to really sort of pick my battles and put some of my older stock through brick and mortar auction houses and just get rid of it because it's it's cluttering up space for the good quality items to be in. 
I think that that's something that we have been through as well, where when we started, we were buying junkier stuff and we had to learn that we needed just to bag stuff up and get rid of it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, the problem is I'm, I'm, I'm too, I want to make, I want to make maximum money on every single yep. possible thing. Yeah. But instead, I, I just need to clear it out, make a little bit of money on it. And then it's gone. Yeah, I you know I don't mean to make light of people with mental illness, but that'd be an interesting like program, like hooking up the hoarders who are always going out getting stuff with like the people who have agoraphobia that don't want to leave their home. <laughs> you know, like one's collecting, one is a listing, and they yep. can all make money. Yep, that'd be interesting. It's strange that there are, there are, there has been a few programs on UK television about that where it's. Uh, obsessive compulsive orders with somebody who's got um, OCD in tidiness. <laughs> <Jeez. I> mean, <laughs> it's car crash television, and yeah. it's, it's all Sorry. essentially it's my world because I'm a, a obsessive compulsive reseller. Yep. Yep. With an obsessive compulsive neat and tidy person, so it's a bit difficult at times. Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. I think some of those things are actually good because I have some OCD. It's myself, but I think I I use it for the power of good. So it helps me organized. organized and get rid of it. You know. Well, thanks so much for talking to us, Tom. We really appreciate wow. it. And uh, you know, maybe one day you'll be able to come to America if you haven't yeah. already and enjoy the the spoils of all of our, you know, amazingness. Of our waste. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's funny. I, I have, I've come over to California to do some, uh, a bit of picking and, uh, and stuff. And yeah, I had to get like an extra baggage allowance of stuff. <laughs> stopped by customs because I've got too much gold and silver on me and they thought I was doing something criminal. So yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd definitely love to come over and, uh, and do that. All right, Tom. Have a good day. All right, thanks. Thanks. Bye, Tom. Bye. Bye.